Okay. So, okay. No. Uh, shall we start? Uh, yes, I'll okay. just uh, share my slides. Uh, uh, okay, I will uh, say a brief intro about you. Then we can start. Yes. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Okay. Sure. Savadatta is currently an associate professor at the Department of Biological Sciences, ISO Bhopal. Dr. Saurav was a brilliant student and passed his master's studies with gold medal from Pondicherry University and got CSAR JRF during his master's. He got a fellowship and did his doctoral degree from Gothenburg University in Sweden and completed postdoctoral research from University of Oxford. He had won uh, two prestigious awards from uh, four uh, postdoctoral studies. First one, EMBO Long-Term Fellowship for Postdoctoral Research, availed in 2010. Uh, second one, Marie Curie uh, Indra-European Fellowship, IEF, for Postdoctoral Studies in 2008. He came back to India with Ramalinga Swami Fellowship from Department of Biotechnology, India, in 2013, and joined Isa Bhopal as Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences. He established his Plant Cell and Development Biology Laboratory in Isa Bhopal, since then, he and his students did extraordinary studies and published breakthrough findings in frontline journals like Plant Physiology, the Plant Journal, Plant Cell and Environment, Natural Plants, Plant Cell, etc. With this short introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Sauro to join Samiksha webinar series organized by AKRC KFRI. Uh, dear Dr. Sauro, please take off from here. Okay. Sauro? Are you are you able to see my screen? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot for the kind in invitation, um, and especially Nafis. <laughs> Nafis, so you, uh, I really it was nice to to get your mail, and then uh, obviously I had to agree. Uh, so, so today I um, will uh, um, I'll just give you a brief introduction about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, is it clear? I am hearing some background noise. Is it clear to all of you? Uh, sorry, it's rain. That's why some noise is coming. Yeah. Ah. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. We can start. Okay. Uh, so just uh, let me know at any point if you. Hello. Yeah. At any point if you are not unable to connect to me, just let me know. Oh. Okay. 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 Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Good. Yeah, so um, thanks a lot for the invitation. So um, I am uh, Saurabh Datta, working at ISER Bhopal. And my uh, lab, uh, I am in, we are interested in understanding plant environment uh, interactions. And today what I am going to talk to you about is the identification and characterization of two molecular players that we identified which play an important role in how the environment regulates plant development and uh, defense protection. Um, so before I start, uh, just a small introduction about the lab. So we call our lab the Plant Cell and Developmental Biology Lab, PCDB. Uh, this is an image uh, of the lab. Um, although it is pretty representative, I think uh, my students uh, might agree that uh, this is probably for the photo. Uh, and in our lab, we are using the 
the model plant Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, which uh, we use to understand how a plant responds to environment. And among the environmental factors that we are interested in, uh, one is light, that how light regulates uh, plant growth and development. And the other is about uh, how nutrients in the soil, they affect root development and how we can, uh, we can enhance nutrient uptake. So today's talk will be about two stories. And both of these are related with uh, the light aspect of the work in the lab. So let me tell you about uh, the first story first. So the story one is actually a serendipitous finding in the lab. So let me give you a brief anecdote how this story started. So what you see here on the screen is a plate where we, we have put this Arabidopsis seeds and the seedlings have emerged. And on the two sides of the plate, uh, you, you see that on one side, there are some seedlings which look more white. They are kind of bleached. And the other side, the seedlings look quite green. So they, they, they are not yet bleached. So basically what was going on here was a very uh, talented graduate student in the lab, uh, Artita Yadav, who has just finished her PhD now. Uh, she was working with, as I told you, we work with how light uh, regulates, how the different light components, how they regulate plant growth and development. So she was working with one of these transcription factors for DBX31, DBOX31. Our research is we, we generate mutants in different genes. Uh, in this case, she had generated mutants of BBX31, both loss of function mutants and overexpressed BBX31. So plants which had enhanced levels of uh, expression of BBX31, so um, 35S using a 35S promoter. Uh, so these, uh, she had generated these and she was doing experiments with these uh, transgenic plants. Uh, and she was putting them together with the controlled wild type plants, uh, seeds in different light conditions. And in one of the experiments, she had popped this plate inside a UV chamber to check what, uh, uh, what effect the, when you change the expression of these gene BBX31, what effect it has on plant development under UV. And uh, she was supposed to take it out after a week. And uh, for, for some reason, she forgot about that plate. And she, she, she took it out after three weeks. And when, when she took it out, then this is the, the plate which we see, uh, which I'm showing you here, is what it looked like after three weeks, where you see that um, all the call zero um, seedlings, they, uh, which is the wild type, they had, uh, they had bleached. Uh, most of them had bleached on the UV. Whereas this overexpressor of VBX31, they were uh, quite green even after three weeks of UV treatment. So uh, she brought this plate to me and she told me that this is what happened and this is what she saw. So I asked her to repeat. And then when, once we repeated the experiments, we saw that uh, every time we were seeing similar effects. So, so we wondered that what is this gene doing that it is in a way giving protection to the plant against UVB. So the question we asked was, what role this gene might be playing to protect plants from UV radiation? So uh, a bit of background about UV. Uh, so this is the solar spectrum. And you see the visible light in 400 to 700 nanometer. And then you have the ultraviolet light, which uh, can be divided into UV A, B, and C based on the, the their wavelength. And the uh, the the UVC, which is uh, the most uh, uh, the most uh, high energy UV, fortunately that is blocked by the ozone layer. Uh, but UVA and B, they can penetrate and they can reach the Earth's surface. And among this, UVB is the one which has um, tremendous impact on human and plant health. So, uh, in humans, you, you probably know about the effects of UV. Uh, you know, like skin cancer, cataract, these different kinds of, if, uh, if you're exposed to high doses of UV, you can have these kinds of uh, effects. Similarly, in plants, uh, the UV radiation can have different kinds of effects. And this uh, effects, uh, these effects are totally dependent on the strength or the dose of UV. So what I mean here is that if the dose of UV is very high, 
then it acts as a stress response uh, and it can damage biomolecules like DNA proteins. It can generate reactive oxygen species. Whereas if it is low, then in fact, it can be a bit kind of a positive factor in plant growth and development. So it can modulate the growth and development of plants in low doses. And this in fact is also utilized in the production of several secondary metabolites in plants. So you, you must be knowing about different kinds of secondary metabolites in medicinal plants, phenolics, so all these can get enriched under low doses of UV. And this is being utilized in, in different industries um, yeah, to enhance flavor and different kinds of uh, wherever you have importance of the secondary metabolites. Um, uh, now a bit about what we know about how this UV light is sensed by the plant and how the, what is the molecular network that, uh, that is known to us. So you may, yeah, hello? Hello, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so UV light is perceived by a photoreceptor which is known as UVR8, which uh, is in dimeric form. And then uh, upon UV, uh, when it perceives UV, it monomerizes. And then it will mm, bind to COP1 and uh, this complex is involved in a signal transduction pathway where it uh, activates this transcription factor high five in the nucleus which in turn will bind to the promoter and regulate the expression of several genes involved with photoprotection, DNA repair. And this will give ultimately the UV protection, the acclimation response of the plant towards UV and the repair of UV damage. Also known is some negative factors in the pathway. These are these RUP proteins, RUP1 and RUP2, which are negative players. And uh, one of these BBX factors, which Arpita was working with, one of them has also been previously identified as a negative regulator BBX24 in this UV signaling pathway. So let me tell you a bit about this BBX proteins. So these BBX proteins, as I told you, they, the name BBX comes from that they have this uh, domains known as B-box domains, which are nothing but they are uh, domains which are rich in cysteine and histidine. Here you have a consensus sequence of the B-box domain. Um, in Arabidopsis, the model plant with which with we, uh, we are working, there are 32 uh, BBX uh, proteins uh, and these uh, 32 BBX, sorry, these 32 BBX proteins are divided into five uh, structural groups, uh, uh, group one to group five. Uh, the, the protein which uh, Arpita was working with was BBX31, which belongs to this group five. And here you see that the BBX proteins can have different structural motifs in addition to the B-box, which are shown in blue. You have the VP motif and the CCT domain. So depending on the presence and absence of these domains, uh, they have been grouped into these uh, structural groups. And BBX31 is the one which, is, uh, which has only one uh, B-box in its N-terminal end. No. Now, before we started looking at the function of BBX31 in, um, in UV uh, production, what we thought was, is there anything in the literature which suggests that BBX31 might have some role to play in UV signaling? So we, we got hold of a very old uh, paper back from, I think, 2004 in PNAS, where, where, which involved some of the, now the world leaders in the UV uh, signaling field in plants, Roman Ulm is one of them. Uh, so uh, in that paper, they, that was the first time they, they had identified the role of high five in UVB signaling, uh, the transcription factor high five, which is a major player in the UV signaling pathway. And uh, among the targets of high five, they, they had found several uh, um, genes which are involved in transcriptional regulation. And this, uh, this is a list from the microarray they had done and under the transcriptional regulation head, you see that the first one which was identified uh, was Constance B-box zinc family protein. Okay, and this turns out to be BBX31. Okay, so it was hidden somewhere in the microarray data almost 15, 16 years ago, but somehow no one had worked on this before uh, about the role of this uh, gene or protein in UV protection. Another quite recent paper, another uh, from another very uh, well-known group, Gareth Jenkins group in Glasgow. So they they worked on the the 
the UV receptor, UVR8, which also acts as a chromatin modifier. And they showed that among the targets of UVR8, they had again identified, this was again a high throughput study, and they had identified several. And in that also, in that list, one of them was BBX31. So this gave us some confidence that probably we are on the right track. Uh, that there, are, there is some evidence which suggests that BBX31 might be playing some role in UV uh, protection. So uh, the questions we asked was, what is the role of BBX31 in light signaling in general, first of all? And the second, how does BBX31 pro uh, provide tolerance uh, to UVB? So to answer this, the first thing we did was we checked the expression of this gene BBX31 under uh, UV treatment. So the promoter of BBX31 has a, a, a UV box, which is, uh, which, is, uh, um, which is present in several genes which are involved uh, in the UV signaling pathway. So this was another um, suggestion that probably this gene has something to do with UV uh, the pathway. Uh, when we looked at the expression of BBX31, uh, what you see here in panel B, figure B, is uh, at different time points. We looked at, and this is time after the UVB treatment, and uh, uh, the, the gray bar is under white light and the black bar is under UVB. And what you see is that under UVB, there is increased expression of uh, BBX31 approximately after one hour after UV treatment, its expression peaks. We also checked uh, how the expression is related with the dose of UV. So we gave it different doses, different strengths of UV, UV one, two, three, these are increased uh, doses of uh, UV. And we see that as you increase the dose of UV, the expression of BBX31 increases. In panel D, what you see here is call zero is the wild type, the wild type plants. And here in black is uh, the expression levels in white light and gray is expression levels under UVB. So you see that when you give it UVB, the expression of this gene increases in the wild type plants. I told you, I showed you the pathway of UV signaling where UVR8 is the receptor followed by COP1 and HI5, which are major players in the UV signaling pathway. And what you, uh, what you see is that if you mutate these uh, genes, then uh, Mm, uh, th then the increased expression that you uh, see under UVB in the wild type plants, you lose that uh, increased expression, indicating that this BBX31 is probably um, uh, playing its role in the canonical UV signaling pathway. So you, you, if you mutate any of these genes, you don't get that increased expression. Uh, now, HI5 is the most downstream target in that UV signaling pathway, and we saw that, uh, that the expression of um, uh, of BBX31 is uh, under um, um, is under regulation of HI5. So we, we looked at the promoter of uh, HI5 and we found that it contains a G-box. G-box is one of those um, uh, elements in the promoters where uh, light regulated elements where HI5 is known to bind. Okay, so it's a six nucleotide CAC GTG this uh, motif. Uh, so we, we wondered whether um, HI5 is able to bind to this G-box to regulate the expression of BBX31. So here we did an MSA assay, and we, 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 could, uh, we could see. So what you see in this panel A is the MSA where we, uh, where, where we checked uh, the, the binding of uh, uh, HI5 to the, the promoter region of BBX31. And we also made mutations in the, uh, in the G box. So wherever you see plus is where you have uh, the presence of either the promoter region of BBX31 or the mutated version of BBX31. And then the high five protein tagged with GST added together with the controls. And what you see here is that high five uh, can bind to the, the promoter region of BBX31, which contains the G-box. But when you mutate the promoter, um, the mutation is in the G-box, then you cannot see the band is missing, indicating that uh, HI5 is unable to, to bind to BBX31, suggesting that HI5 binds to this G-box. We also did some uh, chip assay to see check the enrichment of, of HI5 on the promoter of BBX31. And this chip followed by uh, qPCR is what is shown in uh, panel B. And here uh, you see that call zero, which is the which is the wild type plant, and high five mutant, which was used as a control. 
so in call zero, what you see here is that the black bars indicate uh, it's the uh, like the IgG antibody control, and uh, the 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 gray bar indicates the high five when probed with the high five antibody. So what you see is that there was enrichment of the high five um, on um, on the in, the in the in this call zero line. And what is interesting to see here is that this enrichment of high five on the um, promoter of BBX31 was irrespective of whether you treat the plants with UV or without UV. So you see minus UV and plus UV. In both conditions, there was an enrichment of high five. So this indicates that high five can constitutively bind to the BBX31 promoter. Okay. But however, when we looked at the expression, binding is constitutive. It can bind whether UV is present or not. But when we looked at the expression, then we see that this expression is very specific to UV. So what you see here is in call zero, um, the black is white light and the gray is UV. Under UV, the expression increases. If you overexpress high five, then there is even enhanced expression of BBX31. So this suggests that uh, the high five is constitutively binding to 31 promoter and it enhances the transcriptional levels specifically under uh, UVB. Now, to understand better what uh, what uh, role BBX31 plays, we, we looked at, we ordered some mutants of uh, BBX31. Uh, first, we ordered them from the stock center, but uh, they, unfortunately, they did not have reduced uh, levels, expression levels of BBX31 in those lines. So then we, from, from our collaborator, we got some uh, microRNA gene, gene-induced silencing lines and uh, CRISPR lines, this MIP and BBX31-1 respectively. And we started studying them to understand what role this gene plays in the light signaling and as well as the UV signaling. So uh, what you're seeing here, uh, because uh, this is the first time I'm showing you uh, real Arabidopsis seedling. So what you're seeing here are Arabidopsis seedlings. So these, uh, these are very young six to seven day old uh, seedlings. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the green part are the cotyledons. The, the stem-like part is the hypocotyle. And uh, light has a role that once the seed germinates and the, the hypocotyle elongates and then the cotyledon expands and opens and turns green. Um, so light will try to prevent the elongation of the hypocotyle. This is uh, a property which is we'll, I'll discuss further in the, in the second part of the story. We'll discuss it in more detail. So photomorphogenesis, so the light dependent uh, morphology. So light tends to make the hypocotyle shorter or prevent, inhibit the expansion or elongation of the hypocotyle. So uh, in, in, uh, if, if you have a gene which uh, when you mutate, if that in, in that if you have short, uh, shorter hypocotyles, then that would indicate that the loss of that gene made the hypocotyle more, uh, the plant more photomorphogenic, the phenotype was more photomorphogenic, indicating that it's a negative regulator of photomorphogenesis, okay, and the vice versa. So what you see here, if you look, um, you have different genotypes, call zero is the wild type, then you have the mutants, MIP1A and BBX31. And then you have the overexpressor lines, 35 as BBX31, two lines of the overexpressor, uh, number one and number two. And um, um, below that, we what is mentioned is in the absence or presence of UVB. Okay. So first, let us look at only in the minus seedlings, only the in the absence of UVB. That means that it is in white light conditions. And well, what you uh, see here is that the hypocotyle length in the um, uh, in uh, this is the control the call zero and when you have mutated this bbx31 the, the mip1a and bbx31-1 then you have shorter hypocotyles compared to the wild type and if you overexpress them you have longer hypocotyles okay they are taller the seedlings are taller so this indicates that it is a negative regulator of the white light photomorphogenesis mm. now uh, in uv light UV light has a property that it will further reduce the hypocotyle length. So you, you can see in call zero seedlings, which is the control, once you give plus UV, the hypocotyle length is shorter compared to without UV, minus UV. 
This uh, trend is followed in all the genotypes. You can see that it always gets shorter under UV. But the amount, the, the percentage of reduction that you see is lesser in the mutants. You see that the amount of reduction in MIP1A and BBX31-1 is comparatively lesser than what you see in the call zero siblings. On the other hand, if you look at the overexpressors, the percentage of reduction is higher. So this indicates that it is a positive regulator of UVB signaling. So here we found there was some difference in the way it is acting in white light and the way it is acting under UVB. Now, because um, we had previously seen that high, it, is, it, is, uh, it is in the canonical UV signaling pathway and HI5 binds to its promoter. So we wanted to know how HI5 regulates its uh, role in uh, photomorphogenesis. Um, so for that, what we did, this is again those Arabidopsis seedlings, different genotypes which are indicated below, plus and minus indicating presence or absence of UVB. Uh, and here uh, you see that in addition to uh, call zero and BBX31, we included another genotype, HI5. Mm -hmm. This is the transcription factor, which is like a key modulator of light signaling. And it, uh, this is the one which was binding to the promoter of BBX31. So HI5 is a positive regulator of light signaling, meaning if you mutate it, then it produces really tall seedlings, so long hypocotyl. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what you must re what you must appreciate here is the um, the negative regulator BBX31. When you are overexpressing it, you are getting tall seedlings, and the positive regulator when you are mutating it, you are getting tall seedlings. Now, when we we made double mutants of HI5 with BBX31, we make make crosses between these different lines, and we also overexpress BBX31 in HI5 mutant background. Okay. And what you will be able to see here is when we made the double mutants, the hypocotyl length, uh, both in white light as well as the UVB, if you look only at the wild type for the first instance, then you see that the hypocotyl length is intermediate between BBX31 and HI5. Similarly, when you, uh, when you have overexpressed BBX31 in, in uh, HI5, then you see you get some super tall seedlings. Okay. So meaning that uh, when you, uh, and th that is what has been shown in this graph uh, below, that if you look at there, then uh, BBX31 has shorter than wild type, HI5 has taller seedlings than uh, uh, hypocotyl than wild type. And when you double, uh, we generate a double mutant, it is intermediate. Uh, HI5 mutant has tall, overexpressor of 31 has tall. When you combine these two, you get super tall. So what this suggests is that these two genes are doing things independent of each other. Okay, that is why when you have the double mutant, it is inter intermediate. When you have the mutant of one and the overexpressor of other, you have an even stronger phenotype, even taller seedlings. This was also confirmed when we did a RNA-seq experiment where we looked at genes which are being regulated by HI5 and 31. And what you see here is that there was very less overlap there are only seven genes which overlap between HI5 mutant, which is the tall uh, uh, mutant, and the 35S BVX31, uh, which is another uh, tall uh, mutant. Uh, so in both of these, there was very less overlap, suggesting that the genes these uh, these two um, these two transcription factors are regulating are probably different, and they are acting independent of each other at least in this control of photomorphogenesis, the hypocotyl elongation. Uh, so both in upregulated and downregulated, what you see is there was very less overlap between the two genotypes, the genes regulated by the two genotypes. Now, we went back to the question with which the project started, which was about UV protection. So here, as, as I had shown you in the first slide, uh, uh, what was happening was in panel A, what you see is that if you mutate BBX31, then they bleach more than the wild type. And in panel B, what you see is that if you generate lines which are overexpressing BBX31, we had three different independent lines here, then they stay more green under UVB compared to the wild type called zero. Okay. We measured the chlorophyll content in these lines. And what we saw was that it was lesser in the mutant and it was higher in the overexpressor. We also measured uh, anthocyanin. These are all factors which contribute to, to protection, uh, to photo protection. And here again, we found that there was some um, uh, lower amounts of anthocyanin in the mutants and slightly higher in the uh, overexpressor. 
And uh, together with our, the help of our collaborator in IIT Mandi, we did some metabolomic analysis and there we identified uh, some phenolic compounds which were found to be upregulated specifically in this overexpressor lines. These were uh, this polyphenol called chomeric acid, gallic acid, hydroxybenzoic acid, and vanillic acid. So these are those compounds which are acting as the photoprotectants and providing this enhanced protection to these 35S uh, BBX31 seedlings so that they can remain green under UVB for a longer time. Now, this protection uh, factor, uh, we, uh, uh, here, um, we, we, we wondered that whether um, high five, which uh, in the photomorphogenesis, we found that these two genes are acting independently. But we asked the question that what happens in this UV protection, the UV tolerance phenotype that we see in this one, how are these two genes interacting? So here, uh, what you see in panel A, is um, the four quarters, the call zero is the wild type, and you have the high five mutant, you have the 35S overexpressor, and you have the overexpressor in high five mutant background. Uh, this is in white light condition. Once you move them to UV, you, you see the UC start in the, in, in the first signs of uh, bleaching in the wild type. Uh, in high five, you see enhanced because it's a positive factor in the UV signaling pathway. So if you mutate it, plants become more susceptible to UV. Uh, in the 31 overexpressor, they are more resistant, they remain more green. But if you overexpress 31 in the high five mutant background, even the overexpression of 31 is not helping the plants. They still become susceptible, they are more susceptible um, to uh, UVB. This indicates that the, th that, that, uh, that 31 is promoting UV tolerance in a high five dependent manner. It requires high five for this uh, protection. Okay. So this was also done in terms of we did the measurements of chlorophyll in these different lines and it fell it was exactly um, it fell in line with the phenotypes that we saw uh, that um, in high five you have lower uh, lower chlorophyll uh, levels and uh, in bbx 31 you have higher but if you overexpress 31 in high five mutant again it is similar to high five uh, it's lower also the genes which are being regulated by uh, by uh, these factors to provide UV for protection. These involve these elite genes. These are early light induced proteins. Uh, you have the genes involved in the anthocyanin biosynthesis, chalcone synthase, chalcone isomerase. UVR2 is a gene involved in uh, DNA repair. So all these genes get upregulated when you overexpress 31. Mm -hmm. That is what is shown in this figure E. You see that they are highly upregulated under uh, in the 31 overexpressor. But if you, uh, if you overexpress 31 in high five mutant background, again, you see that they, they come down. So this, um, all the genetic analysis, uh, the physiological parameters that we measured, the biochemical analysis, everything indicated that the UVB protection fact, uh, function of um, BBX31 is high five dependent. Now, uh, high five dependent means that it is acting through high five. So high five must be downstream. Uh, of BBX31 in this pathway. So BBX31 is also a transcription factor. So we wondered that initially we had seen that high five can regulate BBX31 expression levels. So we wondered in this pathway, in the stress regulation pathway, is it possible that 31 is regulating high five because it is uh, acting downstream of high five in this pathway, no, downstream of 31. So uh, in panel A, this is in, in white light condition here. Uh, when we check the expression of high five, then we did not see much difference in the mutants of uh, 31. But in under UVB, you see that when you overexpress 31, the, there is almost tenfold increase in the expression of high five. Okay? Although in the mutant, we could not see a significant difference. So what this suggests that there might be some regulation under UVB conditions where 35 is regulating the expression of uh, high five, especially uh, particularly when you overexpress uh, BBX31, the high five transcript levels they uh, they go up, and this upregulation which you see in panel C, if you look, um, uh, this upregulation which has been shown in gray bar uh, under call zero, this uh, can be abrogated if you mutate UVR8, which is the the photoreceptor for UVB. So when you mutate this, you no longer see this increased expression. Uh, of high five, um, of high five, and uh, even uh, in this line, uh, when you have the uh, mutant of 
uh, when you have the UVR8 mutant and you have overexpress 31, you don't see this increased expression of I5, indicating that, uh, that this is in a UVR8 dependent fashion. So taking together, what I tried to tell you in this first story was that we identified a factor called BBX31, which under white light acts as a negative regulator of photomorphogenesis. Um, and under UV light, it is um, acting together with high five. It's making some uh, reciprocal interactions with high five, where high five and 31, uh, they independently regulate the UV mediated photomorphogenesis. High five can regulate the transcriptional levels of BPX31 by binding to its promoter. Uh, 31, when you overexpress 31, then there is enhanced high five transcript levels. And uh, in a high five dependent manner, BBX31 is regulating the uh, UVB mediated stress response. Okay, so this was Arpita's work, which was published last year. Uh, and uh, it, an article about it was also written in Hindustan Times last year, where this the importance of this work was discussed. Okay, so now let me move to the second story. This is the more recent story, the story that we some uh, we managed to finish during the lockdown uh, and uh, but it published <laughs> during the lockdown period uh, but that is not why i am calling it the lockdown story uh, it is i'm calling it the lockdown story because the story is about how plants mediate lockdown under stress okay so what i mean here is that uh, normally uh, uh, and this is in a very uh, layman's uh, fashion this um, uh, has been made this figure so sprouting meaning the germination so you you everyone knows probably all of you know about this germination so once the seed has germinated after that it has to take a very important decision that whether it should start the greening process open up its cotyledons and become autotrophic okay the basic feature of all plants so this decision making is very critical because uh, it involves a lot of energy to invest a lot of energy in this growth process and if the conditions are not favorable if there is stress either whatever salinity drought whatever if there are stress stressful conditions then the plant would prefer not to invest energy in growth because ultimately it will die it will try to remain in a quiescent state until there are favorable situations okay so this step after germination after the seed coat has uh, opened up the radical has come out this step is known as the seedling emergence and establishment okay where the seedling starts uh, the greening process and op open opens up uh, so here uh, uh, depending on the stress conditions the plant can um, enforce a, a lockdown or a arrest a growth developmental growth arrest Okay, so how this is done is uh, there's a hormone which was discovered almost 80 years back called abscisic acid. Okay, and it was shown that this hormone plays a very important role in the early developmental steps of the plant. So starting with uh, the dry seed, uh, once it is imbibed, it has water, it will imbibation will happen, the testa will rupture and the, the radical will emerge. This step is the first step which is known as the germination this step is inhibited by this hormone known as abscisic acid okay? and after the radical emergence there will be this hypovotile emergence and then the seedling establishment all these steps are known as the post germinative developmental phases or the post germinative growth and here also aba abscisic acid plays an important inhibitory role that it will inhibit uh, this these steps from happening now uh, the, this hormone is known as the stress hormone. So it, it will allow the plant uh, to cope up with stress, not invest too much energy in, uh, in growth, uh, growth fact, uh, in growing so that it can cope up with the stress. Now, how this uh, ABA uh, understands whether the situation outside is favorable or, or not uh, ABA understand how the plant understands uh, includes some crosstalk between external factors and the levels and active levels or activity of this hormone aba in the seed okay so for for germination in particular it is quite well known that light plays a very important role in this crosstalk or interplay so the external cue light will inhibit this the role of aba in inhibiting this germination process so what that means is light promotes germination 
and the hormone ABA inhibits germination. So there is an antagonistic relationship between light and ABA in this germination process. Now, what happens during post-germinative growth is was not very well known. Okay, so there's, here there was some knowledge gap that what, what is what? Uh, how does the external uh, cues, uh, especially light, what is its role in regulating this process where we also know that ABA plays an important role in uh, inhibiting. So the question we asked was that what is the effect of light on ABA uh, mediated, uh, uh, oh sorry, hello, uh, hello. So, so can, you, can, can you still see the slides? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, I, I just, uh, just one moment. Um, oops. Yeah. Uh, so, so what is the uh, effect of light on this uh, ABA mediated post germinative seedling development? This is the question that we asked. So, before I go into the details, I'll just uh, like to give some explain some of the nomenclature so that it's easy to understand the experiment. So uh, what I'm showing you here in the initial the figure is um, one is a cartoon and one are the actual Arabidopsis seedlings when they are grown in dark and in light. And what you see is that there is a tremendous uh, difference between the morphology of seedlings depending on whether they are growing in light or darkness. So in, in darkness, the kind of development is called scotomorphogenic growth where you have a very elongated hypocotyl. So this part is the hypocotyl. And the cotyledons are closed. They are, uh, they have, um, they are folded cotyledons. Uh, they, are, they form an apical hook. The reason for this is that the cotyledons are hiding the, the shoot apical meristem uh, and protecting it from the, the soil and particles and everything abrasive material. So that once it comes out of the soil, then from the shoot apical meristem, all the adult plants of the parts of the plant can develop <coughs> sorry the other development is the photomorphogenic development which is when the seedling sees light uh, here what you see as i told you before the hypocotyl expansion is inhibited so you have short hypocotyl the cotyledons they open up they they, they are green in color and uh, of course now the shoot apical meristem is exposed and from here you will have the, the, the internode, the true leaves that you see that and the, the, the adult parts of the plant will start developing. You know, ultimately, these cotyledons will, once the seedling has reached the surface of the light, ultimately these cotyledons will be shed off and then the adult growth continues. The, the dark dependent growth is something which you have to imagine as when the seed was buried under the soil. So it was trying to come out to the surface. That's why it was elongating its hypocotyl. Now, uh, this is the kind of development you see in light and dark. Now coming to this experiment with ABA. So here, uh, this work was done by another very talented uh, PhD student, Yadu Krishnan in the lab who recently finished his PhD. Uh, so Yadu, he, he put these uh, Arabidopsis seeds uh, in light and in darkness under different concentrations of ABA. As I told you, ABA inhibits the process of both germination and the post germinative growth. And that is what you, to, you see here. Uh, so 0 0.5 and 1 micromolar ABA is the increasing concentrations of ABA. So under light, you see that there is enhanced sensitivity towards ABA. The plants are showing less of this, you know, the, green, the greening that you see here, the cotyledons opening and greening, that is lesser as you increase ABA. Hmm? Uh, but what, what is important to see here is in darkness, this sensitivity is enhanced. Okay, So there is an enhanced sensitivity towards ABA, even in 0.5 micromolar ABA, you can hardly see any of these uh, cotyledons uh, coming out. So this is what is being shown in the graph here. So uh, in, uh, in red line, you have the, the seedling establishment in light. And in black line, you have the seedling establishment in darkness. What you can see here is um, by establishment, what we mean is that the cotyledons have opened up completely. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hypocotyl has emerged, the cotyledons have opened up and they have green, they have started greening. So this the seedling establishment when Yadu measured, then he saw that when there is no ABA, you see that the black and the 
uh, red bar uh, the red line they are almost uh, similar so similar establishment uh, rates in absence of uh, aba but when you increase the concentration of aba you start seeing a, a big difference between whether the seedlings were grown under light or in darkness okay so seedling establishment is much lesser when it is grown in darkness so that means that the, that the sensitivity towards aba is much higher when the seedlings are being grown in dark so now this uh, told us that probably there is some factor which works in darkness which is regulating the sensitivity towards uh, towards aba and cop1 constitutively photomorphogenic one was identified back in the 90s in a genetic screen where it was identified as a as a uh, protein or a gene which is very active in darkness and what it does is that it it prevents photomorphogenesis to happen in darkness what i mean here is in the in the figure what you are seeing here is wild type seedlings grown in dark and in light and this i explained to you before how it looks under dark the elongated hypocotyl uh, closed cotyledons apical hook and in darkness short hypocotyl open and green cotyledons so this is the normal phenotype that you will see in wild type but the genetic screens identified a mutant cop1 which even in the dark it looked like as if it is seeing light it is growing under light so even in the dark it had short hypocotyl it opened up its cotyledons although the greening was not as much as you see in light but several of the phenotypes were similar to what you see in light that's why the name of the mutant constitutively photomorphogenic it was always looking as if it is a phot uh, photomorphogenic phenotype was seen so this cop1 this is a protein which is very active in darkness light inactivates this protein okay and the function of cop1 is that it inactivates photomorphogenesis specifically in darkness okay so we wondered and this is the 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 protein structure of cop1 so it has this ring domain coil domain wb40 domain it's a 675 amino acid protein so we wondered whether this protein which is which is known to be very active in in darkness if it has any role to to play so before we go into that just to tell about the molecular function of uh, this protein so it a cop1 is a e3 ubiquitin ligase so what it does is it will ubiquitinate different proteins and um and the degradation through the 26s proteasome is mediated by cop1 and as i was telling you that it is a protein which is very active in darkness so in dark cop1 is nuclear and in light its activity is reduced both by its nucleocytoplasmic partition partitioning as well as several other factors about some other proteins like spa proteins it makes complexes with them so these all complexes are inhibited during uh, light Uh, by several other factors i'm not going to the details so its activity is reduced during uh, light so this uh, kind of fit well with what we were looking for a candidate which is very active in uh, in darkness uh, so here is the experiment that was done this is what was shown to you before that what happens in normal um, wild type seedlings and this is what happens in cop1 mutant so in cop1 mutant if you see the similar experiment which was done before when this one was done in cop1 mutant in in if you look at the dark uh, seedlings you see that there was very strong inhibition in the dark in the wild type mm, uh, but when you have a cop1 mutant you see that there is not a very strong inhibition in seedling establishment in the dark in the cop1 mutant meaning that when you have inactivated this gene or when this gene is absent then this enhanced sensitivity in darkness so this suggests that probably cop1 is important in this enhanced sensitivity towards darkness so this is what has been uh, measured here you see that there is a big difference between the red line and the black line in the case of the wild type seedlings which is the light and the dark uh, seedling establishment but when you have a cop1 mutant you see that uh, the difference between the light and the uh, dark seedling establishment uh, is very less okay so 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 the aba induced inhibition of this post germinative seedling growth seems to be cop1 uh, dependent now uh, this cop1 is a protein which is quite a ancient protein in fact uh, so um, actually you have cop1 both in uh, you you have it before the divergence of the plants and the animals okay there is cop1 protein even in animals where you uh, where it plays role in the tumor suppressor pathway so here let us discuss about the plant so uh, in plants uh, this is like just showing you the evolution of uh, 
the land plants once they moved uh, from aquatic environment towards uh, land. Uh, and what it looks like uh, that this COP1 is quite ubiquitously present in different uh, plant species, uh, right from, uh, yeah, so like even the green algae, the mosses, the, the lycophytes, ferns, gymnosomes, all of them have this uh, COP1. The ABA pathway probably came into existence during this transition from water to land. So as I told you, ABA is a stress hormone and plants, uh, this hormone came into existence for the plants to, to uh, conquer the new the land. Uh, when they moved from aquatic environment to land, there was a lot of stress involved and to, to cope up with this stress, this, the, the evolution of the ABA pathway probably started somewhere at this point. Now, well, what we, we tried uh, to do here was um, we, we looked at the, the, how conserved is this uh, uh, function of COP1 in the ABA pathway. And for that, we, we looked at um, a COP1 present in a moss, a very ancient uh, plant, uh, Fiscometrella patens. And we, uh, we got a line from one of our uh, collaborator, uh, Ute Hooker. Uh, where uh, the the Fiscometrella patens um, COP1 was overexpressed in the the Arabidopsis COP1 mutant background. Okay, so the idea was to see whether the functions of this COP1 in uh, in this dicot and in this mosses yeah, are they conserved. And here is the experiment. And what you see here, I'll just try to give you the final uh, uh, final message here is. Uh, if you look at the plus ABA line, so here you see that COP1-4, it, it shows um, uh, it is hyposensitive to ABA, so the, they are germinating and opening up their uh, seedlings. But when you, when you are um, uh, overexpressing um, the Fiscometrella patents COP1 in uh, COP1 mutant background, then you again see this enhanced sensitivity towards ABA, indicating that the Fiscometrella COP1 was able to, to rescue the, 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 the phenotype, the COP1 mutant phenotype. So, um, so that says that um, this function of COP1 in the ABA pathway is quite evolutionarily conserved. Now, after having done this, the next uh, question that we asked was, what, uh, what, how does COP1 modulate the ABA signaling pathway? Okay. So we, we understood that COP1 is doing some role. COP1 was initially always characterized with its role in photomorphogenesis. Here we got some clue that it is playing a role in the ABA signaling pathway. Now, how is COP1 modulating this hormone pathway to regulate the germination, post-germination development is the question we asked. And here, we, you know, the first thing that we tried to do was to look at uh, evidences of which are the major players in the ABA signaling pathway. And ABI5, it's a transcription factor, which uh, has been shown to play important role in this post-germination developmental arrest. Um, and here you see its phenotype uh, under uh, ABA in the in this by WS is the wild type and ABA5 uh, mutant. Even five days under five micromolar ABA, you see that the seedling uh, can open up its cotyledons and it shows post germinative development. Uh, so we, 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 we asked whether uh, um, there is a relation between COP1 and uh, ABA5 in regulation of the ABA pathway. And here, what we did was we, uh, we overexpressed ABI5 in the COP1 mutant background. So you see initially call zero, COP1, the overexpressure of ABI5 and in the COP1 mutant background. Uh, well, what you see here is that the overexpressor, uh, uh, when, you, when we overexpress the, the, uh, the ABI5 um, in the COP1 mutant background, then we, we see um, that uh, you can rescue the, the, the you have open cotyledons and uh, there is the post germinative development is uh, happening here. Uh, so so this is what has been has been shown in the graph below. Okay, so this told us that COP1 is acting downstream to to a, a, a ABA because the the phenotype of the 35 S ABI5 in COP1 background was similar to COP1. So this indicates that COP1 is acting downstream to ABI5 to, to promote the ABA-mediated post-germinative uh, growth arrest. So now um, we, we, we looked at, uh, initially we had checked about the expression level and the, both at the transcript level and the, the, 
the protein level, but we did not find any differences. Ultimately, what we found was that uh, the downstream genes uh, to which ABI5, I told you the transcription factor, it is regulating several genes either directly or indirectly to control this post generative development. And our results indicated that what COP1 is actually doing is it is modulating the binding of ABI5 to its downstream genes. Okay, so here what I'm showing you EM1 and EM6 are two of these direct targets of ABI5. And the, uh, the motif shown in, in orange are the, uh, the, the G box type ABRE, which are the ABA response elements. And we could see there was enrichment of, um, uh, of um, ABI5 on, sorry, uh, enrichment of ABI5 on the uh, EM1 and uh, EM6 uh, promoter regions. So that is what is the, the chip followed by qPCR, which has been shown here, here below. Uh, so you see that if you mutate uh, COP1, then you see that this enrichment of EM1, um, of the ABI5 on the EM1 and EM6 promoter goes down, indicating that uh, that the promoter binding and the, of uh, ABI5 on its target uh, genes is um, is being modulated by COP1 and it will be reduced if you mutate uh, COP1. So basically what we, we, we found here was I, I started with this question that the question we asked was that how light is integrating with uh, this ABI pathway to regulate this post germinative development there was a lapse in the knowledge here and what Yadu's study has shown now is that the molecular factor which is connecting these two pathways the light pathway and the ava pathway is cop1 so light inhibits cop1 and cop1 plays a positive role in the ava signaling pathway where it promotes the binding of abi5 to the promoter of uh, the target genes so here we have found an interplay between light and aba in regulating post germinative growth arrest uh, this work was recently published in plant journal um, and so in a nutshell, what we the story was about was that when the, there is a factor called COP1, which is a major player in light signaling pathway, it is a dark, uh, it is a factor which is very active in the dark. When there is light, the activity of COP1 goes down because of its nucleocytoplasmic partitioning and other regulations. And this factor COP1 in the light signaling pathway integrates with the ABA signaling pathway where it is actually modulating the binding of ABI5, which is a key modulator, uh, key player in the ABA signaling pathway, to downstream genes to regulate this, uh, this uh, process of post-germinative development. So uh, that is what being is shown here, that in darkness you have lots of COP1, and because it is positively regulating ABI5 binding to the downstream genes, so uh, the process will be uh, post germinative development will be inhibited in darkness but when you move to light the activity of cop1 decreases and uh, the regulation of abi5 will be reduced uh, and that's why the plant will move towards uh, germinate post germinative development it will open up ecologically if you think it is like the resource allocation once the conditions are induced uh, are conducive there is lots of light available then the plant thinks that now it is time to invest energy in growth rather than um, in stress tolerance. So what it is trying to do is uh, through li light, giving a cue through COP1. So as soon as light comes, COP1 switches off. And when COP1 switches off, the ABA levels or the ABA activity in the plant goes down. And that leads to the post-generative development in the plant. So this is about the second story uh, which I wanted to tell today. Uh, some of the other works which are going on in the lab with respect to plant environment interactions, uh, which I could not talk today, uh, was about some of these BBX proteins. Uh, some work with uh, the nutrient, uh, um, the, uh, there are some mate factors which we study and how they uh, regulate aluminium tolerance and sensitivity. So these are some of the other regions where we, we have been uh, working, but maybe some other time I can tell you about it. Uh, this is the, the group. Uh, I apologize, the last member, Ajar, uh, was not in this image as this image was taken during uh, Arpita's defense last year. Um, but I think other than him, uh, almost everyone is in this image. So, um, yeah, I, I, I especially would, uh, the, the work that I 
talked today primarily the first work was Arpita uh, Yadav's PhD work and the second work was Yadu Krishnan's uh, PhD work and it was also uh, they were helped by other members in the lab. Uh, I would like to thank Aisar Bhopal, uh, DST and DBT for uh, funding uh, and our collaborators Shyam Masakapali at IIT Mandi, Stephen Wenkel at University of Denmark and Henrik Johansson in, uh, in Germany. Um, uh, with this, I would like to end. I am not sure if I overshoot the time. Um, yeah, so, uh, so sometimes it might be good to forget about your experiment if, uh, yeah, that's how our first story began and we ended up finding something interesting. I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Saurav. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving an excellent presentation. Uh, now it's time for discussion. Uh, uh, now we have uh, some. Hello. hello? Yeah, hello. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, now we have some question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first question is from Ishida Chatterjee. Mm -hmm. Uh, dog one gene acts as uh, the switch between germination and dormancy. Is mm -hmm. related to COP one in any way? Is the question? Uh huh. Yeah. So uh, so the the part which I discussed today. So I I dog one is very important in the the dormancy as the as Ishita mentioned uh, dormancy and the germination processes. Uh, so Wim Sope, I think he is the leader in this. He probably discovered that one. Uh, so in in those uh, aspects, the uh, the role of COP1 is yet to be uh, like we, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. But what we found was specifically in this uh, post uh, post germination development, COP1 plays a very important role. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now we have second question. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a doubt. A normal mm -hmm. physiological metabolism of plants or crop might mm -hmm. be tricky as AT genome is fully known, but other crops may be different. Mm -hmm. It's a doubt. It's clear for you. Uh, can you just repeat it once more? Yeah, sure. So no, normal physiology. A normal physiological metabolism of plants or crop yeah. Yeah. might be tricky as AT genome is fully known, mm -hmm. but other crops may be different. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so definitely. So I agree that this is. Um, so the idea is um, to start with a model organism, get some some clues about what is happening in Arabidopsis. And then now what we are trying to do is to, uh, to, to move ahead and to see is similar, are similar things happening in crop plants. Okay, so that is the next step that we are taking now. Uh, of course, having said that, although I said that the crop one is very ubiquitous and it is found in, in almost all plants, uh, but crop one is a very, very, uh, it's kind of too important. Okay, if you, if you play around with crop one, there are a lot of things which ha can happen. So that's why um, it's not very easy to very uh, specifically modulate this process because as soon as you, you modulate the levels of COP1 by some means, it can have some other effects as well. So, so to specifically understand what it is doing in this pathway, we have to probably identify some other factors which are giving COP1 the specificity to act in post-germinative development. Once we know that, then probably doing some uh, work for crop improvement in the future might be possible. So this is mostly related with, it will be related with crop emergence and establishment, okay? How, how this knowledge can be used. I think it's clear. Uh, next question is, how do we translate these findings on model plants into plants from natural habitats?
Yeah. So I think I kind of partly yeah. answered, answered that question in the previous uh, and um, the previous question also oh. was kind of yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think I partly answered that uh, question in yeah, the yeah. previous uh, question. Uh, previous question was yeah. kind of similar. Uh, so as I said, yeah, it, it um, uh, these are early days. So we we have got some lead, and we we have started working on uh, um, like this. This is in the pipeline. Okay. okay. Uh, now we have no more questions. Uh, thank you, Saurav. Okay. Uh, then thanks a lot. Uh, it was uh, really nice. And uh, yeah, uh, if if there are any more queries, feel free to send me an email. I will be happy to answer. Okay, sure. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah.